Hey, it's episode 215, and today we're chatting all about sexual health with my friend Lisa Davis. Lisa has spent nearly two decades of broadcast experience and is a former sex educator. With a master's degree in public health, she is a creator, host, and the producer of the syndicated It's Your Health Radio, heard on NPR, as well as the host and producer of Talk Healthy Today and Talk Fitness Today by AIM Media of Clean Eating, Vegetarian times and better nutrition magazines. She is the host and producer also of the Naturally Savvy Radio and lives in the greater Boston area with her husband, daughter, and three crazy dogs. I know a thing or two of about three crazy dogs in a household. If you have questions about today's content, you can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact and ask me. You can also catch up on previous podcast episodes and notes from today's show by going to keto diet podcast.com. Just look for episode 215 and I've included all the links and resources and everything from today's episode on that page. Okay, let's do this thing. Hey, I'm Leanne Vogel, and you're listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. I've put together a free 21-page guide on achieving weight loss on your keto diet if nothing is working. Grab your free guide at ketoforwomen.com to get the steps you need to overcome the hurdles standing in your way. Thanks so much for listening, and let's get started with the show. My name is Lisa Davis, and I am here for a takeover. I want to thank Leanne so much for inviting me to do this. I am honored. Leanne, I'm a huge fan, and I love not only your podcast, but I love hearing you on other people's podcasts. As a matter of fact, I loved hearing about your journey to health on the Fit to Fat to Fit podcast with Drew Manning. Uh, Drew is featured in my book, Clean Eating, Dirty Sex. Yes, that's the title, but don't worry. It's not about dirty sex, and it's a memoir. It's a cookbook. It's a healthy lifestyle guide. What I'm going to talk about today is sexual health, why it's so important, what it is, how it's helped me in my life, how I've helped others with their sexual health and how listening to this can help you. I'll have lots of tips and advice. Before I jump into the topic of sexual health, I want to talk a little bit about my journey to health. I was the product of a health net and a marathon runner. Both my parents were super, super health conscious. And I was a kid that just wanted to eat as much junk food as possible. So it, it got a little tricky at times. Now, my grandmother was what I call the original health nut. And she got my mom eating that way. And my mom tried to get me to eat that way and it didn't really work. I go into this a lot in my book in the memoir section, so I'm just going to overview it here. But luckily, eventually I found my way to healthy living and I wanted to help others with that. One of the things that affected my wanting to get healthier was I saw my mom really struggle with her health. Now, the irony is that she wasn't eating the wrong foods. As I mentioned, she was a health nut. As a matter of fact, she was very health conscious. Unfortunately, she had some autoimmune disease. And this was back in the 70s and 80s where there wasn't the autoimmune protocol and there wasn't much awareness. She basically went to doctors and they told her that it was all in her head. And I know a lot of women still get that response. And I just saw her go from pretty vibrant to getting covered with rashes from head to toe, losing massive amounts of weight, being really, really sick. And it broke my heart. So when I was 17, I started to swim. And I realized that even though I'd gotten picked last in gym, and not only did I get picked last, but they fought over who got stuck with me, I was going to try something athletic because just the idea of doing anything athletic turned my stomach. But when I realized, oh, I'm just swimming and I can just swim by myself. This isn't a team sport because I never joined a team, <laughs> even though I had real talent at swimming. So that kind of led me on the road to my own health. And when I was 25, I started getting food sensitivities like my mother, and it scared the crap out of me because I didn't want to end up eating brown rice, chicken and broccoli, which were the three things that she could eat without feeling really ill. So I started doing a lot of homework. Uh, it was at this time that I'd worked in the health food health fields, excuse me, for a few years. And I decided that I wanted to eventually go back to school, but I just didn't feel ready. School was sort of a challenge for me. Then my mom got ovarian cancer and that was heartbreaking. And she died about two and a half years into it. 
And at that time, I had established residency where we were living and there was a university with a wonderful public health program. So I decided to go back and get my master's in public health. So I was juggling my own food sensitivities, uh, my fear from having those, my mother's death, going back to school. But eventually I, I figured out I did a food rotation diet, which I highly recommend. And I was able to figure out what was going on with me. And as it turns out, the paleo and the keto diets are ideal for me because grains are not my friend. Now, this was back in the late 90s uh, that I realized that a higher fat diet was ideal for me, but there wasn't uh, a lot of talk about it the way there is now. And I was doing a television show when I got out of graduate school. I had I focused on health education, and health media, and I had this incredible nutritionist on and she started talking about the importance of healthy fat and that it's really the refined carbs that are hurting our heart. And I remember getting so many emails from viewers saying, what is she talking about? Doesn't she know about cholesterol? What kind of hack is this? And I just was completely intrigued and started doing my own research. So that's when I first got on the road to looking at keto and, and paleo diets. And another eye-opening experience happened to me at this time where I, I had to see a doctor for something. And he was amazing. And he asked me, what are relationships like? What's your job like? What's your stress level like? What's your sleep like? And he asked all these fabulous questions and there was no rush. And I thought, this is incredible. Now, later I learned that the type of medicine this doctor was practicing was functional medicine, really looking at the whole person and trying to figure things out. And, you know, you have pain in your toe, but what's going on in the rest of your life? That was really incredible. So I came to this knowledge of of, of fat being healthy and of functional medicine being so important at this critical time where my mom had just died a couple of years before and I was trying to figure out my own health and I didn't obviously want to follow in her path of going from horrible autoimmune disease to ovarian cancer to death. So it was really important to me to learn as much as I could about this and then my goal was to go out and educate others. So after I did the show for a couple of years, it's called Health Power, the talk show where I learned all about healthy fat. I wanted to create my own business. So I was a health and lifestyle coach and I'd go into people's homes and I'd clean out their cupboards and, and we'd go shopping and I'd teach them to, to make healthy meals with, with you know, higher amounts of fat than they were comfortable with. And it took a lot of convincing, but then they would see results and you know, the whole thing. And one of the things that I started talking about back then, and this was in the early 2000s, was about sexual health. And people were surprised by that. And people sometimes were put off by that. And of course, I, I wouldn't bring it up out of nowhere. But if we were talking about relationships or they would say, oh, my husband this or my wife that, I would say, hey, you know, do you want to talk about sexual health? And part of the problem is our society is so uptight and there's such a stigma around talking about sex. And it really is so important. Let's get into what is sexual health and then we can get into why it's so important. And then also how I help myself and how I help these wonderful folks. So there are two definitions that I'm going to share. The first is from the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization defines sexual health as a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality, it is not merely the absence of disease, dysfunction, or infirmity. Sexual health requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as a possibility of having pleasure and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. Now, the American Sexual Health Association, their definition of sexual health is sexual health is the ability to embrace and enjoy our sexuality throughout our lives. It is an important part of our physical and emotional health. Being sexually healthy means understanding that sexuality is a natural part of life and involves more than sexual behavior. This is huge. This is a really big takeaway. Recognizing and respecting the sexual rights we all share, having access to sexual health information, education, and care making an effort to prevent unintended pregnancies and STDs and seek care and treatment when needed, being able to experience sexual pleasure, satisfaction, and intimacy when desired, 
being able to communicate about sexual health with others, including sexual partners and healthcare providers. So those two definitions are really important. I like how the World Health Organ- Organization defines it as a state of it's physical, it's emotional, it's mental. There's so, a social aspect. That's what I talk about in my book, Clean Eating, Dirty Sex, because it's not only the foods we eat, which we'll get into, and the exercises that you do, but it's also your emotional state, your social state, how you feel about yourself, how you feel about your partner or your partners. It really is about looking inward. While I was doing my business, I also worked as a sex educator. Now, as a sex educator, it fit more with the American Sexual Health Association's definition, where I did talk with uh, teens and young adults about understanding that sexuality is a natural part of life, about sexual rights, about STDs and uh, pregnancy prevention, and also about experiencing the sexual pleasure and satisfaction because for a lot of young women and teen girls, it's really not about that. And they're oftentimes, or in my experience, I found doing it for reasons that wasn't about their sexual pleasure, but was about having a boyfriend or feeling worthy. And I want to just talk just a little bit about my own experience with having an unhealthy relationship with sex. And then we're going to jump into the why sexual health is so important. So I, uh, I don't know if I'd call myself a sex and love addict, but I was definitely on the border of that. I was very awkward and very skinny and very uncoordinated and very uncomfortable in my skin. And that was apparent. Again, you can read more about this in the book, Clean Eating Dirty Sex in the memoir portion. Uh, I share some pretty humiliating things that happened. And it's also very funny. And there's lots of uh, good humor in there as well. So I think you'll enjoy it. But at any rate, I started having sex uh, at 19. And I discovered that after years of being shunned by boys and young men or teens, I started getting lots of attention, late bloomer, big time over here. And I started using it to feel worthy and to feel good about myself. And it wasn't about the pleasure at all. I often didn't feel respected, but I still felt like this is going to prove that I'm not that loser that I always felt like growing up. So eventually I was able to turn things around and got some good therapy and some good help. And it did make a difference. Although even now, I still sometimes struggle with attention seeking behavior and I have to be really careful online. And it's a it's a tightrope. It's tough. Luckily, I have a very understanding husband who will, you know, I'll talk openly about, you know, I've been online too much. Or I, I got to be careful what I post. For some reason in 2015, I, I got to really look at what was going on because I posted way too many pictures of myself with cleavage and it's embarrassing, but I've gone back and deleted I would say most of them. So for me, finding my way to a healthy relationship with myself, a healthy relationship with sex has been really life changing. And to be able to bring the work that I learned as a sex educator to the work that I did as a lifestyle coach, health and lifestyle coach was really incredible because in when I worked in sex ed, I was working with older teens and young women. And then when I was working as a health and lifestyle coach, I primarily had uh, women, uh, I would say 30 to 40, 30s and 40s who had families. And while we were cleaning out the cupboards and while we got to know each other, we would be able to talk about some of the intimacy issues, the communication issues uh, that came up around sex with their partner. And to be able to help them and to get them on the right path was really, really satisfying. One of the things that it took, though, was for them to be open, for them to, if they had issues around sex, if it made them feel uncomfortable to talk about this, to why does it make you feel uncomfortable? How were you raised? What, what do you think about? About. And to get them to get a different mindset around it, to shift the paradigm and feel like it's okay to be sexual. It's okay to want to enjoy my body and to explore my body through masturbation, to be with my partner and to ask for what I want. And it also is important to talk about things that I talk about in the book, like resentment and trauma. There's a lot of women have trauma and it can really affect your overall health and your sexual health. So getting open, feeling like you can look at this topic and challenge your beliefs on it 
is really key. And I found that was something in addition to the information that I'm sharing in this podcast, and then I'm going to continue to share was what really helped these women and young women make healthier changes in their overall lives and also in their sex lives. And I think one of the most satisfying things was seeing young women say, you know what? I don't want to have sex with that guy. And I'm not going to do it just because he wants to. Or it's not just all about his pleasure. I'm going to ask for what I want as well. And that was super empowering. Today's episode continues after this short message from one of my sponsors who make the show possible, plus give you some great deals on my favorite things. Today's show is brought to you by Four Sigmatic, the makers of my favorite magic elixirs like the Lion's Mane Elixir. Add to coffee, your morning tea, smoothies, shakes, you name it, and watch your anxiety go down and your cognitive function increase. Each of their elixirs are formulated to support various aspects of your health and wellness, from brain function to energy production, relaxation, and more. They're easy to travel with, you can add them to any liquid, and they're pretty tasty too. Use the coupon code KETO, all in caps, for 15% off all things at foursigmatic.com slash keto. Unsure of the link? Check out today's show notes for all the details. Now that I've defined what sexual health is, let's talk about why sexual health is so important. As I mentioned earlier, sexual health goes along with physical health and mental health and and intellectual health and other types of health. It's just because of the stigma. It's not talked about as much. Now, mental health still carries that stigma. And luckily, there's so many amazing people out there doing things to help break that down. And it really is so important. So we need to talk more about mental health as well. Sexual health still has that stigma. And, you know, my calling my book Clean Eating Dirty Sex, to say I've gotten some flack is an understatement. Number one, it's it's a play on words, clean and dirty. There's nothing dirty in the book. But number two, I think just having the word sex, I had an argument when I went home for the first time in 17 years this summer. I was talking with this elderly gentleman. Okay, he was 94. So what do I expect? But he didn't, he was wasn't upset about the word dirty. He was upset about the word sex. How could I put that out there in society? I'm making things worse. And I said, but sexual health is so important. And I define sexual health and we tie. He couldn't see past that. And I could say, well, because he's 94, it's a different generation. But I'm getting that from people at all of all ages. And it really is sad to me uh, that we can't have these open conversations. So I want to have it here. So here we are. We're talking about sex. We're talking about sexual health. And it's more than just avoiding unplanned pregnancy and diseases. It's it's recognizing how important sex can be in your life and how it can benefit your body. There's a lot of things that having sex can do to benefit you. For example, it increases your heart health. It strengthens muscles, reduces your risk of heart disease, stroke, hypertension, lowers blood pressure. Did I mention burns calories? I might have mentioned that. Another thing is it helps strengthen your your immune system. There was a study of immunity of people in romantic relationships who had frequent sex. Uh, This was one to two times a week. They had more uh, immunoglobulin A that's IgA in their saliva and the people who had sex less than once a week. Now, it's we all want strong immune systems. So I figure, hey, why not if you can have more sex and that works for you. But there are things that make it harder to have more sex, which we'll talk about. And that's what I'm hoping in this talk to help you overcome, to help you find ways to make it easier for you to be more sexually active. All right. Another thing is better sleep. And this can come from masturbation as well. Yep. I said it. I went there. The M word. There's stuff about my book in that as well. It's very important. Uh, so if you are you don't have a partner, uh, self-stimulation is really important. It also helps with these things. It, it can lower your blood pressure pressure, burns calories, heart health, that stuff that I mentioned. With the better sleep, that's, you know, a longer lifespan. I mean, we all know how important sleep is as well. One of the things that's interesting too, and I'm going to focus on women here, is that when you have an orgasm, it releases natural pain relieving chemicals and increases your blood flow, which is good for your body. It can also reduce incontinence. It can relieve premenstrual and menstrual cramps. It can help produce more vaginal lubrication, build stronger pelvic muscles. It's so important to to be sexually active. And like I said, if you don't have a partner, and by the way, if I should preface or not preface, I should re-say that if you do have a partner, 
I still think masturbation is really important. Let's talk about the ways that sex benefits you on an emotional, a mental level. It really can help you with your feeling of trust and intimacy. And it can help you to let express your emotions. It can boost your confidence. It's really, really key. So I encourage everybody to take the things I'm talking about today and put them into action. So what I want to talk about first, I want to talk about foods for improving your sexual health, because there are some great things that we want to keep in mind. When I'm talking about foods for sexual health, and this goes back into the keto, which is great, is we're looking at healthy fats. We're looking at antioxidants flavonoids, nitric oxide. Okay, let's start with healthy fats. Now, some of this you might already know, but I just wanted to go over this quickly. Uh, healthfulpursuit.com. I just love this site. What to eat on a keto diet. This is from the wonderful Leanne. And I just want to talk a little bit about the types of fats that we're looking at. So saturated fats, uh, they are salt at room temperature. They're great for higher temperature cooking. They've gotten a bad rap over the years, but they're actually awesome for our health. And this is Leanne's words. I'm reading from her sheet. Great for the heart, liver, brain, nervous system, and more. Helps increase HDL cholesterol. These saturated fats examples are beef, coconut oil, lamb, bacon, tallow, suet, and butter. Monounsaturated fats, uh, these are MUFAs. I think some people call them MUFAs. Uh, these are typically liquid at room temperature and solid when chilled, moderately stable and good for for light cooking between 320F and 350F. Look for words like cold press, French centrifuge extracted and expeller pressed. Uh, there's little chance of consuming oxidized fats, which can cause cell damage. And examples of these are avocado oil, olive oil, almond oil, hazelnuts, avocados, macadamia nuts. And then there's a polyunsaturated fats that are always in a liquid state. They're more likely to become oxidized. Uh, their foods containing these oils, such as salmon, trout, hemp seeds, chia seeds, and flax seeds should be minimally heated just until cooked. And some examples of these are salmon, flax, and hemp. So what we want to be focusing on consuming often is the saturated fats. Consume often is a monounsaturated fat. So it's MUFAs and use sparingly are the polyunsaturated fats. In my book, Clean Eating Dirty Sex, I reached out to over 50 wonderful health experts. And one of them was Dave Asprey. And I asked him to share some information. I'm going to read right from the book. So Dave shared quality fats are clean burning energy sources that keep your body and brain running at maximum capacity. It's time to end the era of fearing fat. Let's look at some of the ways fat actually helps you. Dietary fat contains more energy per gram than any other nutrient. So it's the most efficient way to deliver energy to the parts of your body that need it, like your brain. Compared with protein or carbohydrate, fat has the lowest impact on insulin levels. Insulin spikes are what lead to energy crashes and weight gain. Now, some of Dave's favorite ways to get healthy fats, uh, and these are mine as well, is avocado oil, coconut oil, dark chocolate. Now, remember to go sugar-free. There's plenty of great options out there. Extra virgin olive oil, ghee, grass-fed beef and marrow, a butter from grass-fed cows, pastured egg yolks. Now, for me, I love to get my healthy fats from avocados. You know, on the days that I eat a whole avocado, I have more energy, I think better, and I'm satiated because fat makes you fuller longer. And you may be thinking, holy cow, a whole avocado. But then again, you're here listening to a keto podcast. So you might not be thinking that. Yep. You know, because what I'm not eating is the highly processed grains and the sugars, which raise insulin levels and make you ravenous. So as you can see, there are many benefits to eating healthy fat that not only affect your overall health, but your sexual health. And it's not just hormone production. It's the other things that I just talked about. It's going to feed your brain. Well, your brain's important for sexual health. Your energy levels are important for sexual health. Hormones, you might not know this, but they're actually formed from fat and cholesterol. So without fats, your production of hormones would suffer. They also help with the absorption of fat-soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K. And a nutrient deficiency, I don't know if you know this, but it can cause hormonal imbalance. And if you're not getting enough fat, that can be the problem. So make sure that you're enjoying the healthy fats that I mentioned at the beginning. And we're going to get more into hormone balance when we talk about perimenopause and menopause, which is going to come later on. All right, so we've covered fat. Let's talk now about antioxidants. So what are antioxidants? 
Antioxidants are natural substances that promote healthy circulation of energy through increased blood flow. Healthy circulation helps the body cleanse itself of toxins as well as reduce out of control inflammation. So antioxidants are really key because they clean up the free radicals that cause inflammation to blood vessels. And when you have a healthier endothelium, the endothelium is that lining in your blood vessels, you will have better blood flow. So some of the foods that are high in antioxidants that are good for the keto diet are asparagus, avocados, berries, and dark chocolate. Those are just to name a few. Uh, Of course, leafy greens are wonderful, and those are okay as well, because we're looking at very low-carb vegetables. So we're looking at our arugula, our bok choy, our escarole, our dandelion, our daikon, excuse me, our chives, our celery, spinach, and radicchio, these all are high in antioxidants, which are super important. So when you have your antioxidants and they're keeping up with the free radicals that can are unstable atoms that can damage your, your cell walls, you're going to have better blood flow. I hope you're really enjoying today's episode. I'd love to see where you're listening from. Snap a pic and tag me at Healthful Pursuit or leave a review for the show on your favorite podcast player. It helps me out tremendously. Okay, back to the good stuff. Let's jump into the next thing, flavonoids. Now, flavonoids, they're a diverse group of phytonutrients or plant chemicals. They're found in almost all fruits and vegetables. So this is the same list. We've got asparagus, avocados, berries, dark chocolate. Remember, I've mentioned it before, but be sure to go sugar-free. Now, on the keto diet, there are so many great and acceptable ways to get your antioxidants. Let's go back to Leanne's wonderful blog post, What to Eat on a Keto Diet. You can just type that in on her website, healthfulpursuit.com. She has this great chart with the names and the pictures of the vegetables. And she's got arugula, alfalfa sprouts, avocado, bok choy, cabbage, celery, onions, cucumber, daikon, escarole, endive, fennel, jicama, lettuces, mushrooms, radicchio, radishes, sour kraut, spinach, zucchini. So those are packed with antioxidants. And then there's some safe and moderation vegetables, artichoke, asparagus, broccoli, broccoli rob, broccoli flower. I've never seen that before. That's awesome. Brussels sprouts, collard greens, cauliflower, eggplant, green beans, hearts of palm, kale, kohlrabi. I've never had that. Leeks, I love. Okra, olives, peppers, pumpkins, rhubarb, snow peas, snap peas, Swiss chard, and more. So there's some really great stuff. And those as well have flavonoids. I mean, I'm huge on lots of vegetables. If you're on the keto diet, of course, you want to go for the very low carb vegetables, and you will get your antioxidants and your flavonoids. Let's go to nitric oxide. Now, nitric oxide is incredibly important because what nitric oxide does is it is a vasodilator. So you got the antioxidants that are cleaning everything up. You've got the flavonoids that are also helping strengthen the cell walls. And then you have the nitric oxide, which is going to make them, these little vessels even larger and are really great for blood flow. So where do you find nitric oxide? You find it in beets, garlic, meat, that's meat, Red meat, poultry, seafood, they are high in CoQ10, and that helps preserve the nitric oxide in your body. Dark chocolate that has flavanols, it also is great for nitric oxide as well. Leafy greens, which we've talked about, so that's fantastic. Uh, Pomegranate, nuts and seeds. Uh, Watermelon is a huge one, but again, that is a a sweeter fruit. Uh, So there are other ways to get your nitric oxide. So when you put this all together, there is science behind this, looking at the healthy fats, the antioxidants, the flavonoids, and the nitric oxide. So we've looked at fats and other important nutrients for sexual health. And now we're going to talk about exercise. In my book, Clean Eating, Dirty Sex, I have a chapter, Movement and Connection. And I'm going to read from this. Uh, Food and sex are immensely more enjoyable when you are in your body and loving the body you are in. Moving and connecting to yourself is a wonderful prelude to moving and connecting to another. Since cardiovascular health is essential for sexual health, I suggest that you find something you love to do that gets your heart pumping, your body lengthening and strengthening. Do it 
by yourself, for yourself, or ask your partner to join you. So let's get into some of these. Okay, so exercise is wonderful, of course. It's going to help with your cardiovascular health. And again, this is going back to blood flow. There are some exercises that are really great in particular. For example, lifting weights because you want to boost your testosterone because when you have the higher testosterone, that is associated with your libido. And so it's really important to have the muscle mass. It affects both men and women, the dropping testosterone levels as we age. So it is important to do some sort of lifting weights or even band exercises, some sort of resistance. Another thing that is really important is to get some kind of cardiovascular exercise that you enjoy. You can ride your bike, you can run, you can do it on a treadmill, you can go for a a brisk walk, uh, you can jump rope, you can row machine, you can row on a river. I mean, there's so many different things. So we can get that circulation going. Another thing is yoga, that there has been some studies that have shown that yoga is actually good for increasing your sex drive. And I found that with my husband. So not only does he have kick-ass yoga arms, but he has a higher sex drive. So it's really wonderful. Partner yoga is another great thing that you can do with someone you love or even just someone you like. And dancing is really good. You know, when I was in high school, my parents would do folk dancing. No, not folk dancing, square dancing. And my mom would have her crinoline skirt and my dad would have his matching shirt and they would grab my mom's ice packs because she had knee problems, but she did it anyway, even though it would hurt because she wanted to get out there and do something with my dad that brought them closer together. And I saw their connection, which was really key. And it was a really wonderful thing. And there's a lot of psychological benefits to partner dancing. It increases social interaction, your confidence, self-awareness and mindfulness. So get out there and dance, dance by yourself, dance with your partner. Definitely can help. I'd like to move on now to a bit about communication. Because if you don't know how to talk to each other, it can be very difficult. So I'm just going to share one here. And that is about iMessages. So iMessages communicate directly what you want and need. And they increase receptiveness from your partner. For example, Uh, I would love for us to become more connected sexually rather than you messages like you don't seem to want much sex anymore. You messages are often perceived as attacks, which may elicit defensiveness. When I was a kid and my parents would talk about using I messages, I thought it meant like giving each other certain looks with their eyes, (laughs) E-Y-E-S's. I really did for years. I'm like, what are they? I don't see what's happening here. But eventually I learned what an I message really is and how much it really can help. So what I'm hoping you're taking away from this podcast today is that when we're talking about sexual health, it's more than just food alone just exercise alone, just learning to communicate alone. It's all of this together and more. And when you're able to take a holistic view of your sexual health, the way you take a holistic view of other parts of your health, it's really life changing. So the last thing I want to talk about today is hormonal health. I touched on this a little earlier when I was talking about healthy fats, which are good for hormonal health, but I just wanted to talk a little bit more in depth about my own experience and then uh, some wonderful advice uh, from Candace Birch, who is a a hormone health educator. I'm going to read you something from the book that I, I think she's amazing. At any rate, when I turned 43, I hit the wall and I hit it hard of perimenopause. I was cranky, pimply, sweaty, angry. My PMS was, which was usually pretty mellow, was just off the charts. I felt like I I couldn't control how irate I would get. My poor husband and daughter were like, what did you do with my wife and my mom? And I was thinking, what did what happened to me? Where did I go? Why am I feeling so out of control? So it was a really tough time. And these hormonal imbalances are common. For some women, perimenopause starts in their 30s. They say the average age is 43. So I'm rarely on time for anything. I didn't go through puberty till I was 17. So <laughs> it's just like, uh, I guess it, I, they figured, well, we kind of screwed you over on the beginning. Let's uh, let's get you in the in, in the uh, in the ballpark here for um, perimenopause. So for me, I found that I did have to add uh, some bioidenticals, like I mentioned. Today's episode continues after this short message from one of my sponsors who make the show possible, plus give you some great deals on my favorite things. 
I've been a Fabletics VIP since September 2018 and save oodles of money on workout wear for physical activities from the gym, sailing, yoga, and beyond. The prices are fair, meaning if what's stopping you from getting out and moving your body is a fresh set of leggings, you can get the leggings and get out there. Fabletics is offering listeners of the podcast an incredible deal you won't want to miss. Get two leggings for $24. That's a $99 value when you sign up as a VIP. Just go to fabletics.com slash keto. Plus, you'll receive free shipping on orders over $49 and international shipping is available too. Again, that's fabletics.com slash keto. Unsure the link? Simply check out today's show notes for all the details. I want to read something from the chapter on hormones and sleep. I interviewed the wonderful hormone health educator, Candice Birch, MA, and she has a column where people write, and I I just love this. It's called Dear Libido, Why Did You Leave Me? Dear Libido, why did you leave me? And what do I have to do to get you back in my life? Sign No Mojo. And she writes, Dear No Mojo, you just might be walking around with an undetected hormone imbalance that's been sabotaging your sex life. Why and how does this happen? Well, hormones work in synchrony to bat to maintain balance, sort of like an orchestra, where if one instrument is out of tune, the whole symphony suffers. Or like a seesaw, where too much weight at one end causes the board to swing wildly back and forth before it eventually slams to the ground. And so it goes with hormones. Take testosterone, the hormone we all associate with the drive, desire, and libido of the species. Potent though it is meant to be, testosterone has to take a backseat to cortisol, the master stress hormone that when operating in overdrive will make us too tense or tired for lovemaking. When stress hormones stay stuck on the high end of normal for too long, it is not unusual for the hallmark systems of hormone imbalance to set in. Mood swings, insomnia, headaches, and feeling generally annoyed, impatient, and definitely not in the mood. Another all-too-common libido-lowering scenario is estrogen dominance, a situation where estrogen levels are too high relative to too low levels of testosterone, its balancing partner. The classic imbalance tends to trigger overproduction of a protein known as SHBG, or sex hormone binding globulin. You don't have to remember that. (laughs) But what you do need to understand is that when there are too many SHBG proteins around, on account of excess estrogens, they actually deplete testosterone, making it unavailable for the heavy libido lifting. At the same time, estrogen dominance also runs interference on thyroid function, blocking or slowing it down, leading to lethargy, weight gain, depression, and other low thyroid culprits, none of which do much for one's libido. So my considered advice is to find out if you have a hidden imbalance that may be diminishing your desire by testing your hormone levels as soon as you can, say by a saliva test. This is the most convenient, stress-free, and painless, no needles way to measure hormone levels. Saliva and blood spot tests too can measure bioavailable or free hormone levels to help identify which hormones are actively at work in your body and which are playing hooky. Shedding a light on this hormonal playing field can illuminate long ignored imbalances that may not only be the culprit behind a libido gone AWOL, but a number of other unwanted symptoms that you had no idea were caused by a hormone imbalance. Getting tested is the way to go. I completely agree. I got tested and it changed my life. I was low in estrogen and progesterone. So I ended up taking bioidentical hormones. I do already eat a keto paleo diet. Um, I stay away from the processed carbs and the sugars. I eat the foods that I talked about earlier and it still wasn't enough. I would encourage you to get tested and then see what you can do with food, with uh, supplements. And then if that doesn't work, it's definitely worth talking to a functional medicine doctor and seeing if hormones are right for you. So we're coming to the end of the podcast. And I just want to reiterate again that sexual health is really important. And it's so key that we are able to challenge the way we think about sex and question ourselves because it really is great for our overall health. We talked about the food, the exercise, the communication. Remember, there is no shame for having an enjoyable sex life. There's one last thing that I haven't mentioned, and that is erectile dysfunction. And erectile dysfunction is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to heart disease. In fact, men 45 and older are 50% more likely to be hospitalized for heart disease if they have moderate to severe ED. So this is really important because you can get a sense if you're, if you're a man that 
okay, if I'm having these problems with erectile dysfunction, that means my blood vessels are narrowing. This means I can be more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. So if you are involved with the man and he is having erectile dysfunction issues, this can be really serious. And I know it can be hard to get a man to go to the doctor. I'm not trying to make generalizations. I've been in the health field for 25 years. I've done not only health media, but I've worked in a lot of different hospitals and clinics and different settings as a health educator. And it's something that I would hear a lot from women. But if it's something that you can bring up, no pun intended, to your man, uh, that would be really, really important. So we need to be able to talk about these issues and we need to be able to be okay with wanting to have good sex and realizing that it is a good, important part of a relationship. And if you're feeling unfulfilled and you're not really sure what's going on, I encourage you get the book, Clean Eating Dirty Sex, try the foods. There's over 50 recipes. There's issues from resentment to healing trauma, to exercise, to there's a whole chapter on skincare. So there's a lot. I want to end with a very short passage from the book, from Dr. Pankaj Vidge about finding your why. I think the biggest piece is the why. You start with the why because once you have a strong why for whatever it is that you are trying to do, the where, who, how, and when would all fall into place. You have to peel the onion a few times and really ask why five or six times. Why do I want this? Why do I really want this? Why am I really doing this? Let's get to the bottom of the real motivation. The real thing that motivates me is my lifetime dream of climbing Mount Everest or my dream of being able to play tennis with my grandson and beat him in one game. To me, those are bigger goals than just looking good in a dress. Finding out what that why is, and when we peel the different layers of the onion, we find out that we are all very similar. We all like to have beautiful experiences. We all like to learn new things. We all like to grow and contribute in some way. Those are our highest needs and those cannot be fulfilled if we do not have good energy flow and we are tired and foggy headed all the time. I absolutely love that passage. And for me, I had to find my why as well. Uh, recently, I got diagnosed with arthritis in both knees. My kneecaps have never tracked right. And I've done PT before. I mean, the arthritis diagnosis is new. That really threw me. But I've never really stuck with them. And finally, it's like I hit a wall and I thought, what am I doing? I'm never going to be able to use my body the way I want to if I don't keep up with these PT exercises. I had to look inside and find my why, which is to be active as I get older and older and older and to stay active. And I have been religious about my PT exercises and my knees are doing so much better. So I really encourage you take Dr. Vidge's advice and definitely find your why. Before I go, I just want to mention where you can find me. I would love to hear from you. My email is healthpower18 at yahoo.com. Email me any questions that you have. My website is www.itsyourhealthwithlisadavis.com. You can find my podcast there. There are four currently there. There are two that I'm still doing. The two that I am doing are Naturally Savvy Radio, which is based on the wonderful website, naturallysavvy.com. And I'm also doing Talk Healthy Today, which is coming back soon with all new episodes. Leanne, I would love you to be on both Naturally Savvy and Talk Healthy Today. I do Talk Healthy Today with A Media. They do Clean Eating Magazine, Vegetarian Times, Yoga Journal, Muscle and Performance, Better Nutrition, and more. So that would be really great if you would like to come on those. So again, please reach out to me. You can also find me on social media. I'm primarily active on Twitter. It is Health Media Gal one health media gal the number one and i am terrible at instagram but if you like pictures of super cute dogs and some healthy food and a few selfies here and there but without cleavage okay maybe once in a while there'll be some cleavage uh you can find me there uh, my instagram handle is at it's your health with lisa davis but honestly i'm not there very much uh i need some lessons so Anyway, I just want to thank everybody again. This has been super fun. I'm so honored that Leanne asked me to take over because I've been such a fan of hers. And to be able to share how keto can help you with your sexual health, as well as exercise, communication, getting in touch with your body, and the other things that we talked about today, and the other things that I talk about in Clean Eating Dirty Sex have meant so much to me. So thank you all so, so much for listening. 
Such a great episode, right? Oh, Lisa is brilliant, and I'm so happy she got to come on the show. And also, I forgot to mention, I'm starting up a new podcast called Love Rebel. You can search for it in your favorite podcast player. Just look for Love Rebel. New episodes are coming out in 2020, but there's a little special episode there waiting for you right now. Subscribe, and I will be back, I guess, in a couple of weeks. Oh my gosh, time is flying. I can't believe it's December already. You can subscribe today so you don't miss any episodes. Again, that is Love Rebel. Next up on the Keto Diet Podcast, we have Sunday, December 22nd, episode 216. We're chatting with Genevieve Castonge about her experience finding keto and really defining what worked for her and her story is so beautiful. I can't wait to share it. And then on Wednesday, December 25th, episode 217, Amanda Perry is taking over the show chatting about, can you trust your body? Is it trustworthy? So join us for those episodes and I will see you soon. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor should it be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program. 